Whether you realize it or not, you've almost certainly seen a QR code in the last month. Chances are that you've seen one this week, or even today. They're all over the place, these little codes, and they're used for a variety of purposes. Now, QR codes began their life as essentially just an upgraded UPC barcode. Those are the little barcodes on all the products at supermarkets and other stores. The little block of lines that gets scanned at the checkout to see how much the item costs, but which is also used for inventory control purposes by the folks who work there. Scanning that barcode allows them to keep tabs on how much of something they have in stock, how many individual items from a new shipment have been checked in, and other general purpose tasks of that nature. QR codes were invented in 1994 to serve a very similar purpose within the automotive industry in Japan. I'll link to an image of a QR code in the show notes if you don't know what I'm talking about here, but it's basically a square of black and white shapes, and it looks something like an immensely complex, if quite small, crossword puzzle. But what you're looking at is actually kind of like a UPC code, but one that can be read vertically as well as horizontally, which vastly increases the amount of information it can contain. Rather than simply tying a product to an inventory number, like a UPC, a QR code shows the version, format, and correction keys for the QR code itself. So those three chunks of information tell the QR code scanner what it's looking at and how to read the rest of the code. And the rest of the code then tells you the position, alignment, and timing information for the car component to which the code is attached. Or at least that's what it would tell you if you were using one of the original QR codes, the ones that were used primarily in the Japanese auto industry. So although when we look at a QR code, we just see a block of black and white noise, seemingly random blocky blobs, a scanner that knows what it's looking for can derive a good amount of information from it, which can then be used, if that scanner is connected to the proper supplementary software and hardware, to do other things. This is how QR codes are often used today, and why you have probably seen one recently, even if you don't work at a Japanese auto plant. Most smartphone cameras today can recognize QR codes and have software baked in by default that will allow your phone to see the data contained inside these codes. So you don't even really need a separate app these days on most phones. Snap a photo of a QR code with your camera, and the operating system in your phone will do the rest. And that means, for instance, if you see a QR code on a sticker affixed to the side of a building as you're walking to work, you can scan it, and your phone may then take you to an event page for a concert that's taking place later that week. Or it may take you to a download page for a free ebook. Or it may take you to a landing page for an escort service. And this is where the modern conflicted nature of these codes arises. They're potentially quite useful. I still remember the first time I scanned a QR code on a sticker affixed to a light pole, and I was given a free EP from an artist that I hadn't heard of as a result. It was a pretty cool experience. And this was pre-Spotify and other streaming services, so it was also quite valuable in a way. It felt very exclusive. When used well, these codes can be fun gimmicks and can also be quite useful in other ways. A QR code on a patient's wristband at a hospital can speed up the process of working people through a complex, potentially flaw-ridden system and can ensure that everyone has the necessary, most up-to-date information as that information is updated. You scan the code, and your device shows you every single thing the medical system knows about that person that is stored in the main computer database that that QR code is linking you to. That's pretty wonderful. That's pretty useful. But these codes are not always used so intentionally. The writer behind the unmarketing blog, Scott Stratton, wrote a book entitled QR Codes Kill Kittens, How to Alienate Customers, Dishearten Employees, and Drive Your Business into the Ground, in which he describes some of the most ridiculous, thoughtless use cases for QR codes. Included as examples in that book are stickers that say, visit us on Facebook, 
and which include a QR code that can link people to the relevant Facebook page, but which are then attached to a door that automatically swings outward when you get too close, potentially knocking people's phones from their hand if they try to scan the code. Other very common uses include putting QR codes on billboards that can only be seen by people driving on freeways, which seems more than a little dangerous, not to mention unwieldy, as distance and movement are not great combinations for people trying to take photos of barcodes that need to be fairly crisp and clear to be read by devices, alongside putting QR codes in airline magazines where they can only be seen by people who likely don't have access to the internet on their mobile devices because they're mid-flight, and still other examples of people using QR codes that send users to websites with videos or other media that cannot be displayed or played on a mobile device. And mobile devices are the only customer-owned devices that are likely to ever scan a QR code. Now all that said, there does seem to be a lot of potential here with these codes, particularly when blended with other technologies like augmented reality. I've seen shirts and jackets, for instance, that have QR codes on them that will play some kind of video or augmented reality graphic over the garment when viewed through a phone's camera, adding an additional layer of context and interest, not to mention artistry. It allows you to essentially play a video, perhaps, or a moving image on that garment. I've seen QR codes used in newspapers, which, when viewed by your device, allows you to play a game over the newspaper itself within the graphics and words on the newspaper, which is kind of fun and interesting. And it alludes to a lot of potential use cases for traditional publishing and other seemingly non-technical spaces to blend technology with their more simple analog publications. I've also seen QR codes used in grocery stores affixed to produce in a way that initially seems a little weird, but then if you scan the code, a recipe might pop up that makes use of that apple or banana you're holding, which is fairly clever, I think, especially when used on less common ingredients like jackfruit or something like that, which you seldom see in the US in which people might not know how to use, that scannable recipe then could be a real value add for everyone involved. What I want to talk about today starts with an unusual application of QR code technology before migrating into a discussion about tech-enabled interactions of this kind and how both society and morality might evolve as a consequence of that shift. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent listener-supported show, which means it is brought to you by you. There are myriad different ways to help support the show. You can leave a review up on iTunes. You can share it with a friend or with your social network of choice. You can contribute monetarily via PayPal or Venmo. You can find buttons and options for that at letsknowthings.com slash contribute. You can also contribute monthly via Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash let's know things, you might also consider purchasing one of the books that I've written, both fiction and nonfiction. You can find a list of those at colin.io. Any and all contributions are super appreciated. You and your support is what makes this podcast possible, and I very much appreciate it. Another great way to help support the show is to check out our sponsors, the first of which today is Everlane, my favorite clothing company. And they're my favorite because they don't make use of a lot of visible logos. Generally, it's nice, spartan, minimal clothing. It's well built. It's not trendy. It tends to last. This is the opposite of fast fashion. And it's high-end clothing that is not priced in a high-end way. They cut out most of the fees for marketing and brick-and-mortar costs and things of that nature so that you are paying for the garment, not for the company's efforts to sell to you, which is also quite nice. And if you go to letsnotethings.com slash Everlane, I will receive a commission for any purchases that you make over there. So I would never encourage anybody to buy anything that they do not need, but if there is currently a gap in your wardrobe that you're looking to fill, they are a wonderful option, and visiting them through letsknowthings.com slash Everlane is a great way to kill two birds with one stone, both 
filling that gap and helping to support the show. And the other sponsor today is Audible. I am a huge fan of audiobooks. If you enjoy podcasts, chances are you will also enjoy audiobooks. And Audible is a massive library of audiobooks, hundreds of thousands of them. And if you are keen to give the audiobook thing a try and are not yet convinced, consider popping by audibletrial.com slash L-K-T. If you do so, you will receive a free month of Audible to give it a shot and a free audiobook of your choice from their massive collection. If you do not currently have a book in mind to spend that credit on, stick around till the end of the episode and I will give a book recommendation. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I want to start from today comes from Boing Boing, and it's entitled Airport Lounges Will Let Anyone In, Provided You Can Fake a QR Code. This article is from August of 2016, and so is the story that it summarizes. Boing Boing is a site that generally links to content from elsewhere and then adds some additional context or commentary. And in this case, they referenced a few similar stories and summed up the story of what happened here. And they did so contemporarily to the story itself. And what happened here is that a security professional and computer hacker named Shemek Yurashevsky, who travels regularly for his work as a white hat hacker slash security expert, found while on one of his trips that an airline lounge at the Warsaw airport was mistakenly rejecting his boarding card, thereby denying him access. Though when I say boarding card, what I mean is boarding card information, because what seems to have happened is the software that determines who should have access to this VIP lounge and who should not uses a QR code scanner to read a QR code on the boarding pass. And that gives the folks at the entrance to the lounge the information they need to figure out who can come in. And in this case, the QR code on his pass said, basically, that he should not be let in. He is not qualified to access this lounge. But he was qualified. And he was more than a little miffed about being prevented from going in and enjoying the higher-end offerings of this airline lounge. So being a hacker and a security expert, he tackled the problem by writing a 600-line program that spat out a new QR code, which contained information that would allow him to access the lounge, and which, out of necessity, identified him as a different fake person, because his real name was attached to that incorrect lounge access information. And this fake QR code worked. They let him in, and he later gave a talk about this experience and his workaround to solve the QR code problem at DEF CON, which is a conference for security-focused hackers. Now, I want to stop there for a moment and really emphasize what I just said. What sounds like a fun story of a professional being jerked around by a sprawling, clunky tech system and then heroically bypassing that system using cleverness and know-how could also be summarized like this. A security expert hacker wrote a piece of software that allowed him to be where he shouldn't have been inside an airport. There are a lot of other components to this story that I think, upon first glance especially, make it seem like a hero's tale. It certainly was that within the hacker community. I mean, he gave a talk on this very subject and used it as a case study around which to orient a bunch of advice for airports, for the security personnel running these airport lounges, for the airlines themselves. It was a compelling way to frame the aha moment that led him to tell these big corporations that, among other things, they needed to figure out how to prevent manipulation of these relatively simple tech solutions that are saving them money, but are also potential weak points, are opening up new weaknesses in their security apparatus. But all that said, what is being celebrated here is a hacker hacking his way into a place that he shouldn't have been, into a secure location within what's supposed to be already a very secure location, a place that is crawling with military-esque personnel and weaponry. I mean, he should have had access to that lounge. 
It was a glitch that was keeping him from entering. A misalignment of information between the airline lounge's computers and the airport's computers. So when the QR scanner pulled up his information, it didn't have the correct complete information. And as a result, it denied him access. So he should have been able to access that airline lounge, which is part of what makes this seem like such a victory over the ponderous and fumbling airline industry. But according to guidelines, according to the rules, rules that are enforced by a whole lot of guns and serious people wielding those guns, people who are denied entry based on the information on their boarding pass and the information attached to that boarding pass in the computers should not be in some areas of the airport. So by all rights, he should have been arrested and treated as a potential terrorist. And if he'd been caught in the moment, that very well might have happened. But we can't know because he only spoke about it after the fact when giving this presentation. Now the situation raises some interesting questions, I think. And I want to address some of these questions by presenting a series of speculative scenarios that I think it might be valuable to consider one by one. So take a moment to think about each of these as I describe them. The first scenario is one that happened in real life in China, where a man bought a refundable first-class airline ticket and then used it to eat for free at the VIP airline lounge at the airport for a year. This lounge is provided as a bonus for spendy airline travelers and will generally only be used once, maybe twice, by the traveler before they board their flight. In this case, though, the man bought the ticket, ate at the lounge, and then exchanged it for a new ticket for a flight the next day, which allowed him to return the next day, eat at the lounge, exchange his ticket again for the day after that, and so on. After exchanging his ticket in this way 300 times, the airline figured out what he was doing and confronted him, and he stopped eating at the lounge. When it was all over and he'd been caught and he stopped abusing that freebie built into the system, he got a full refund for the ticket one last time, meaning that the year of free VIP lounge food was well and truly free for him, except for, one would guess, the cost of transportation to and from the airport each day. In an article written about this scheme in the New York Post, representatives for the airline admitted that there wasn't anything they could do about it. It was within the letter of their rules at the time, if not aligned with the intention of those rules, that he could do something like this and get away with it. So a man hacked the system, not in the computer sense of hacking, but in the sense that he cleverly figured out a way to get about a year's worth of free meals without paying a cent for them, and he did it without breaking any actual rules. Now here's the question. Was this an ethical thing for the man who bought the refundable ticket to do? Was it okay, not in the legal sense, because it was clearly okay, at least at the time, before they changed those rules as a result of the hack, legally, but was it okay in the moral sense? Was he clever or lucky enough to stumble upon a free food gold mine, something that any sane person would take advantage of given the opportunity? Or was he making a morally questionable decision, regardless of who was hurt or not hurt, and what laws were broken or not broken, technically? That particular story took place in 2014. This next scenario happened a few years earlier, from 2011 through 2012, and it involves a man in Germany who attempted a similar scheme. He used a VIP lounge for free food and drinks and other services about 35 times over the course of a year before being caught by the airline and having his ticket refunded. He then bought a new ticket and tried doing the same a few more times before the airline sued him for a breach of contract. Their claim being that ticket holders who use the airline's facilities without actually intending to travel, which is the purpose of the ticket they bought, after all, are essentially stealing services from them, which are only supplied for free to those who, again, are intending to travel. They refunded his ticket once more, but then charged him around 2,000 euros, which amounted to something like 55 euros per lounge visit. 
The courts, in this case, sided with the airline, and the man was forced to pay. So here's another question worth asking, I think. Is this a case of a big corporation overreacting and punishing someone whose only crime was to figure out a clever flaw in their system, who hacked them in a way and they were just sore about it? Or is it a case of someone actually stealing from a business and therefore getting what he deserved, or even getting off easy, potentially, since they conceivably could have sued for more, claiming reputation damage and things like that, in addition to the cost of the meals? And further, again, was his attempt okay, morally? If you find a flaw of this kind in a system of this kind, and if that system seems so big that they're unlikely to notice or perhaps even care that just one person is abusing it, is taking advantage of a possible legal blind spot, is that justified or is it a morally repugnant act? Is it the airline's responsibility to close all such gaps and their problem if they fail to? Or is it the discoverer of that flaw's responsibility, morally or socially, or however you want to view it, to not abuse such a flaw despite discovering it and having the ability to do so? Now let's flip back to Mr. Yurashevsky, the security hacker who faked the QR code to access the airline lounge that he should have had access to, but which his credentials said he did not have access to. Is it okay that he faked a set of legal credentials to access a VIP airline lounge that he should have had access to to begin with? Or thinking about it another way, is it okay if a person uses their lockpicking kit to open a locked door to an area that they should have had access to, which shouldn't have been locked for that person to begin with. The key they were given for that locked door didn't work on the lock due to someone else's mistake, not their own. So is using a lockpicking kit and their lockpicking skills on that door to bypass it okay? What about if he shouldn't have had access to the lounge? What if this particular flight, or his airline status, or whatever, normally granted him access to this lounge, but it did not on this trip, for whatever reason, and he used this QR code faking trick to get in anyway? Is that okay? Or what if he should have had access and didn't, but he was being kept out for some very good reason? Maybe there was a police sting going on inside that lounge, and they were trying to keep the uninvolved people out. Or maybe he specifically was being investigated for something, and they were trying to keep him relegated to a specific area for observation. Does that change anything about his decision? And does him knowing or not knowing about these variables change anything about your perception of his decision? And those variables here, I think, do make a difference, or they could make a difference in the way some of us view this scenario. And that's good, I think, in that we don't want to paint with a broad brush, but it's an issue in that, in many cases, there wouldn't be any way for this hacker guy to know about some of those variables, and so he may have hacked his way into this lounge with the best of intentions for both himself and eventually, once he offers up his security advice later for the airlines. But it could have been that by taking liberties and deciding to bypass something that the system said he should not be bypassing, that there are laws against him bypassing, he was actually messing with forces beyond that which he was considering. He was annoyed at not being let in to the fancy part of the airport, and in allowing himself to follow that annoyance to a direct path solution that involved breaking the rules, he could have caused more damage to himself or others. That, in a lot of ways, is the reason some of these laws exist, right? To keep us from causing harm we wouldn't have any reason to know we were causing. Now, some might argue that, hey, it's just space, and those airline lounges are seldom even close to full. So, security theater concerns aside, it's kind of a victimless crime either way, right? The chair he occupied would probably have been left empty if he wasn't there to fill it, and any food or drink he might have consumed would be just a drop in the bucket, not even a fraction of a digit on the expense sheets of the airline managing that lounge. But what if, again, let's imagine for the sake of argument, 
that this VIP lounge is particularly crowded on that day, and there are no spare seats. He gets the last seat, and he's not meant to be in there. He shouldn't have access, but he gains it through this QR code generating software he made. Other people who should have access to that lounge are being turned away at the door because he is occupying a seat that one of them should be occupying. Now, is his action okay? I think that variable could make a difference for some people and their perception of this situation because at that point, he's harming not just a big faceless corporation, causing pinprick scale damage, but another individual human being whose day is perhaps ruined, just as his was or would have been in real life, having to spend maybe hours in the normal, uncomfortable hubbub of a crowded airport, rather than in the relative calm of a lounge that he has paid for, either directly or as a bonus, due to all the airline tickets that he has purchased over the years. Does that change the moral algebra at all in your mind? Does the size of the victim, and the type of victim, and the scale of damage done to that victim, because of their size relative to the person inflicting that damage, impact how you see this act? What if we were to, once more, go back to the way things actually were, and we say that he should have had access, but his digital documents still say otherwise? The lounge is crowded, and if he takes a seat, someone else who should be there, and whose documents also say they should be there, will be turned away. At what point is it more correct, morally, for him to adhere to the rules, flawed as they are in this case, and personally harmful to him? When is it more correct for him to bow to the decision of this technology to not let him in? Is it more moral for him to bypass that technology and fake a name and other data to get inside, or more moral to accept his glitch-induced fate that he didn't do anything to deserve, but to accept it nonetheless and allow other VIP members whose credentials, in this case don't need faking, to access the few chairs that are available instead? Or here's another question. What if instead of a QR code reader, the defender of the door was just a human being? And what if that person had faulty information? They were using a list of names to determine who should be allowed into the lounge, and his name wasn't on there for some reason. So this hacker hacked that person instead of a security device. What if he convinced the guard to let him in using charm or with a lie? Or he got a look at that list and presented himself as someone else, maybe using graphic design skills instead of hacking skills to cobble together a fake ID that said he was one of the people on that list? What if he used the same skill set to swap in a fake list when the guard wasn't looking and replaced it with a list that had his name on it? Now, a few of those variables are kind of what actually happened. He faked boarding pass information, including a fake name that was displayed through a QR code, along with other information that said he should be allowed into the lounge. So that in mind, is the situation any different if he's using a fake driver's license rather than a fake QR code? Is it any different if he's faking out a person, lying to their face, rather than faking out a little camera attached to a computer? Is one way in more legit than the other? Is one way of hacking the system more respectable than the other? Now, I probably should mention that according to the letter of the law, faking boarding pass information to trick a QR code camera to get into a private airport lounge is illegal. Finding a way into an area you do not have permission to access in such a space is very much trespassing. Tricking the security, they have guarding that space even if that security is arguably flawed, is still fraud. Eating the food and drinking the drinks provided in the lounge, when you're not supposed to be in that lounge, and when those snacks and drinks are meant for people who have access to that lounge, is stealing, plain and simple. But the reason this example is interesting to me is partly because it has enough perceptual gray area that you could argue that while it may have been technically illegal, it was perhaps morally okay on some level, from some perspectives, but also because it opens up questions about how we should perceive systems of this kind, how we should address their flaws, and how we should feel about bypassing or abusing those flaws in different situations. To better explain what I mean by that, 
Let's take this example out of the airport, beyond TSA screening and all the clutter of that complex security infrastructure. Let's simplify things and imagine that there's a convenience store that's currently unmanned. There's no one at the checkout till, there's no manager in the back. It is a building that is vacant of staff, left completely untended. And what's more, the doors have been left wide open. You can just walk right in if you were so inclined. You could just take whatever you wanted and no one would stop you again if you were so inclined. So the question is this, if you walk into that unoccupied open door convenience store, take a candy bar and walk out, who is most responsible for that crime? Because it is a crime. You're taking something that's not yours. No one gave you that candy bar. There weren't any posted signs saying, please come take a candy bar for free today only. What you saw instead was a system bereft of consequences, at least implicitly, and decided that that meant the laws those consequences are meant to enforce don't apply to you for that moment. No one will punish you for taking the candy bar. So the laws those punishments make tangible are no longer a thing. They're only theory at that point, unenforced theory. I think a lot of people, provided those circumstances, would take a candy bar or would at least consider doing so. At the very least, it wouldn't seem like as big a deal as it might otherwise seem because the people doing the taking would not be acting sneakily or anything. They wouldn't be shuffling in and hiding a candy bar in their pocket and walking out under the gaze of somebody who is meant to watch them and prevent them from doing so. The convenience store people, it could be argued, are kind of asking for it, right? And I don't think that folks would take a candy bar because they're just bad people or anything like that, or because they wouldn't have the money to buy a candy bar under normal circumstances. I think people would be tempted under these specific circumstances because many of our systems are set up in such a way that the rules of operating within that system, in this case the small economy of a convenience store and the larger economy and the legal system in which that store exists, it's enforced from the outside in rather than the inside out. So in other words, if you remove the punishments for not towing the line, the incentives that keep you walking the pre-prescribed path, far fewer people will tow the line because the norms of that particular system are enforced by outside forces, by those laws, by the tangible threat that you will be punished if you do not tow that line. So it's a bit like driving on a road that lacks any painted lines to show you where to go. You might know generally where you're supposed to be, like which side of the road to stay on, but your form and precision is likely to be a little less perfect than it would be otherwise if there were concrete barriers on your left and your right keeping you on a very narrow path. And in that same way, there are neighborhoods where that vacant open door convenience store would be empty within an hour because it's those concrete barriers that are keeping people on the path they need to be on to not be breaking the law of the land constantly. Now, there are other neighborhoods where I suspect you could leave that place open for weeks and no one would take a thing. It's in these neighborhoods where each resident sees themselves as part of the system rather than being under the jackboot of the system. They are responsible, each person individually, for enforcing their accepted local norms, for making their neighborhood what it is. And as a result, they know that their actions are what shape the space in which they live. They know that the well-being of their community is determined in part by their individual behavior, even when they're not under direct scrutiny. So they could choose to take a candy bar and would not suffer any legal consequences, no punishments for stealing, but they would then be forced to live in a space in which theft is a norm. And that could then spiral to include other sorts of things that they just would prefer to not have as a concern in their neighborhood. So for many people, the norms they create or reinforce by not taking that immediate delicious payoff, not stealing the candy bar, will be more valuable than a free snack. And I'm guessing there are a million different reasons why different areas might respond differently to this situation on average. Why, for some, that tiny immediate payoff will be worth what they're giving up. In a lot of cases, for instance, they may not equate their actions to the well-being of the larger community to begin with. 
in others what they're stealing might be so vitally important to them, to their stomach, or to their sense of wanting to get ahead, to have more things, that even if they recognize what they're doing to their neighborhood as a result will be negative, the trade-off will still seem worthwhile. According to some ideologies, number one, that is yourself, is far more vital than any community you're a part of. And as such, even if the payoff for you is small and insignificant compared to the damage dealt to those around you, that's still a legit choice to make. That is the ideological conclusion that some people will come to. And so the response to this type of scenario will differ greatly. I wanted to draw that particular analogy out to that extent because most of the spaces we occupy, most of the communities we are a part of, are shaped by roughly the same things, both internal and external. What allows us to live together without everyone killing each other over every perceived slight, or the physically strong continuously taking from the physically weak, is the establishment of a system that dissuades that type of behavior. And that system can be predicated on outside incentives, like knowing that you will be fined or jailed, or otherwise punished for doing the wrong thing, or on internal incentives, like feeling that you are a bad person if you break with cultural expectations, and if you do things that are frowned upon by your neighbors, like stealing. The latter is the consequence of well-spread and respected norms, and the former is the consequence of effective and in some cases quite visible, but at the bare minimum implicit, consequences for those who step out of line. And the former can lead to the latter over time, but in most cases, at a certain point, it flips over and you need less threat to get the same results if you instill a certain internal incentive system. And for a long while, civilization seemed to be moving in a certain direction, moving away from the implicit threat style of management to the internal incentive style of managing a community. But today, many of our communities in which we operate are not physical communities. Some of our most valuable relationships are at the very least the maintenance and enjoyment of some of our most valuable relationships take place in a digital space. We stay in touch with our loved ones throughout the day on Facebook or via text message. We flirt on Tinder or Instagram. We discuss current events on Twitter and Reddit. Some of these spaces are a bit like digital versions of the real world. We build online communities that reflect our offline values. And as a result, we might see somewhat different angles, different heretofore hidden facets of people we already know, but the differences largely end there. But in other cases, our relationships with these people, with whom we're interacting, begin and end online. And as a result, there are often no clearly defined social norms, in the sense of norms that you might find in your neighborhood, in real life, or at your school, or at your business. Yes, there are online communities where people do their best to make sure that newbies know what's okay and what's not okay, but most of these spaces are more like unpoliced airport lobbies, with countless people swarming in and out all day long. People from all over the place, with different social values, different expectations and priorities, different ideas about why they are there, how they and others should behave and interact, and everything else. There is little chance of a complex internal self-enforcement system working within those types of spaces. And as a result, the online equivalent of concrete guides along the road, different types of outside force that are used to maintain order, are generally required. And that force generally takes the shape of punishment, or at least the threat of punishment, to incentivize good behavior, however good might be defined within that particular community. In real airports, those punishments can be quite severe, while in the online, airport-like community, those consequences might be a quick boot out of the community, until you rejoin with another alias at least, or some kind of diminishment to your fortune made up of the coin of the land, whether that be some kind of point system or prestige label, or your position within search rankings. Now that in mind, we are entering a period in which more and more of our interactions, especially those that involve gatekeepers and enforcers of norms, like bank tellers and shopkeepers and airport lounge security guards, will be automated. They will be machines, just hardware running software, 
and some will be pretty sophisticated according to the narrow standards necessary to do their job, but they will also be flawed, as was the case with the QR code faking security hacker. And what's probably more important, in my mind at least, is that this changeover will likely spread aspects of the online version of community further and wider offline. Meaning that although using these types of gatekeepers, these norm enforcers, will cause some good, they will do the job better in some cases than humans could, at least by some standards, but they'll also incentivize us to approach these spaces differently to view more of our shared space as guarded convenience stores rather than convenience stores that we wouldn't steal from no matter what because we feel like an important component of making sure that our shared spaces are good and pleasant. Again, this is partially because we humans are being removed from that infrastructural formula. It's no longer human personality, human actions that determine how things operate. It's a robot version of the same. But it's also partially because of that implied additional distance between us and the systems that keep things organized, that are threatening us to a certain degree. If I'm clever enough to get around that silly machine's glitchy defenses, then I deserve whatever I can take. I mean, it's not like I'm hurting anyone. Some big corporation and some broken robot are being bypassed and maybe dinged for a fraction of a decimal point's worth of profit. Big deal. Maybe I'll take two candy bars. So if you see yourself as an integral part of a network of individuals and vital systems and of their continued beneficial operation, chances are you will be less likely to take the candy bar. Or maybe if you really need that candy bar at the moment, you would recognize that the system is flawed but still leave money for the candy bar on the counter before leaving. You want the organizational entities to succeed despite they're maybe currently doing their job badly, despite leaving the doors wide open for abuse, whether those are physical or metaphorical doors. So you do what you can to bend yourself for them and help them correct their actions. If you don't see yourself as an integral component of your society, though, of that tangle of nodes and connections that make up the area where you live or where you find yourself that day, you will probably be more likely to take the candy bar. And maybe more than that. I mean, why not? The door's wide open and the likely consequences will not touch you. And this way of thinking seems to be amplified when our behavior is more consistently regulated by threat-leveraging moderators. Which is to say, if you take something without paying for it, you will be punished. If you walk into an area where you're not supposed to be, like an airline lounge, you'll be punished. Under those types of circumstances, it makes a bit more sense to take advantage of an open door because the usual guidelines, the barriers that show you where to walk, are missing. If they're not there, well, that's their fault, right? How could you possibly know what is correct and what is not correct when the threats are gone? A system of order maintained by individual ethics, on the other hand, stores those guidelines inside of individuals rather than in threats and physical barriers, because each person sees themselves as the barrier, as the door, or at least a piece of those barriers and doors. When something is off, you know that you are partially responsible for setting it right within such a system. If a door is left open, you maybe help close it rather than taking advantage of it. The trouble is that systems predicated on individuals having an internal sense of ethics in these regards tend to fragment anytime you try to scale it. Within relatively small groups of people, let's say up to 150, which is one of the numbers that's most often bandied about as the ceiling for such things, you'll be more likely to see the direct results of your actions and know the people affected by them or know someone who knows the people affected by them. That increases the chances that an inbuilt system of guilt and respect for that system will be maintained. Go above that number though and you'll have more people, people who are moral and good by most standards, seeing opportunities where other people might see flaws. It's easy to justify away taking a candy bar from a great big convenience store, because who's it hurting? You don't know the owner, and you need that candy bar more than they do, at least conceivably. They've got a ton of candy bars, so what's the harm? It's their fault for leaving the door open and not watching their customers to make sure that nobody takes one, according to even well-meaning morality operating at that scale. Now that shift that I mentioned over to a more roboticized version of all of these walls and punishments, I don't think it's a change that's going to happen all at once, or to everyone. I actually find myself saying please and thank you to robots that I interact with, 
to the series and Alexas in my life. And I'm guessing that other people will likewise adapt at least some aspects of their existing approach to human-based communities to include the entities in this new setup, meaning that if they were already destructive within one environment, they'll probably be destructive in this new one as well. But if they were maintainers, if they were people who saw themselves as a vital part of keeping their community nice, they will be more predisposed to do the same here as well. They will adopt these robotic systems into their schema, into their way of seeing things. But that said, there are a lot of stories out there about hardcore internet trolls, of people who spend their free time online harassing people, calling them names, insulting people to make themselves feel big, poisoning every possible conversation with nonsense and vulgarity, trying to push strangers towards suicide, even doxing other people, finding their personal information and then posting it online, potentially putting that person at physical risk. And many of these trolls, when the guise of anonymity is stripped away and we get to see who they are in real life, are not obvious hardcore douchebags. In some cases they are, but not always. In some cases the people in their life, in their real physical, real world life, are surprised to discover that their son or their wife or their boyfriend are these despicable monsters in one world and seemingly polite upstanding citizens in another. These stories are just anecdote, I know, but I'm guessing we will see much of the same as the real world begins to operate more like the online world, in the sense that machines become gatekeepers, and a person can walk up to the QR code camera guarding the door to an exclusive area, be told that their boarding pass information does not allow them inside, walk away for a few minutes, and then try again with a new QR code containing new information, including a new name, only to be welcomed in by that same machine, as if nothing strange just happened. These systems are not just flawed in the same way that any security system is flawed. They're flawed in new ways. They're hackable in a way that most people would not be hackable. And that presents more opportunities to manipulate communities and systems for personal gain in a relatively anonymous way, which in turn allows more people's monsters, their inner monsters, their inner trolls, to come out in more spaces. Even those who seem otherwise polite and upstanding might begin to show more of their monstrous side in more real-world situations. Now let's take a step away from that rough collection of scenarios and shift the same discussion towards something that happened just recently, recently as of the day I'm recording this at least. Or maybe I should say it's something that has been happening a lot lately and doesn't show any sign of abating, so it'll likely continue to happen and get worse. But one well-publicized event of this kind happened recently, and what I'm talking about specifically is the hacking of HBO and the subsequent release of a bunch of unreleased shows and scripts for shows created by the network, including the super popular show Game of Thrones. This is not the first time that HBO has been hacked, and it's not the first time that hackers have threatened to release Game of Thrones episodes early, either. And interestingly, it doesn't look like any complete Game of Thrones episodes were acquired in this attack. The hackers ended up with seven times as much data as was stolen in the previous largest hack against a media company, which was in 2014 against Sony. But they only seem to have gotten an advanced Game of Thrones episode outline, not an actual episode of the show itself. But, despite that, a version of that episode, which was episode 4 of the 7th season, ended up online about a week early anyway. It was apparently leaked by someone connected to an HBO distribution partner called Star India. And alongside that, other HBO shows were released early as a result of that big hack. None of the shows are as big as Game of Thrones, but it was still a pretty substantial embarrassment for the company and potentially quite damaging to their bottom line, not including the cost of all the investigations and bulking up of their security that they'll need to do post-hack. They earn their money by airing these shows to people who pay to access them. So if those shows are no longer behind that paywall, their business model in turn becomes less stable. So let me ask again a question that I asked earlier, but in this new context. If what we're talking about here is not a convenience store, full of tangible goods, with its doors wide open and no one manning the register, but instead a TV show out in the wild, available to download by anyone with access to the internet, 
No walls around it. No money required. Does that change the mental math that you do to figure out whether or not you should take it? The company involved here is a different size. HBO is a nearly $2 billion company, while your neighborhood convenience store is presumably substantially smaller than that. The products involved are also different. If you steal a candy bar, that's one of a finite number of candy bars the store has in stock, and they paid for each candy bar. So a candy bar that is stolen is one they cannot earn a return on. It's lost money. You taking a candy bar is a direct financial loss for the store owner. A piece of digital media, on the other hand, is infinitely reproducible without any additional cost. Meaning if one person watches it, or a million people watch it, it costs the network the same amount of money to produce. There are distribution fees of a sort. If you pay for HBO's services, it costs a very small amount to send all those bits of information to screens around the world over the internet or on cable. But it's a good bet that if you're stealing the show, if you're not paying for it, you're also not using the distribution infrastructure that they operate to send that show into the world. So that cost for them disappears. In short, on a practical level, the only way HBO will notice you consuming their product for free is if you theoretically would have otherwise paid them for it. If you cancel your subscription, for instance, or do not subscribe when you were intending to subscribe because you can get the show for free instead. So the dynamic here is a very different one. But is it different enough to change the morality of the act? Does it change the fact that you are taking something without paying and thereby potentially, even if just in some theoretical roundabout way, hurting the company that meant to earn an income from that good? Does it matter that HBO is a sprawling multinational corporation with more money than God and which is unlikely to even notice your act of piracy? You're downloading their hacked or leaked show without contributing a dime to their bottom line, without helping repay the vast sums of money they invested in making that infinitely reproducible good. Is there a moral difference between watching a pirated work and stealing a candy bar from a convenience store? Now, this is a subject that I've addressed a few different times in a few different ways on past episodes, so I won't dig too much deeper into those specific questions here, though they are interesting questions. In some ways, there's an argument to be made for creating more apparatuses that make things ultra cheap or free due to the technologies that we have and will have in the interest of creating more value for more people with the same resources. But there are also good points to be made that our economics haven't yet shifted enough to allow for such things to happen on scale regularly while still allowing most creators to operate, to survive, to continue to create things. It's well and good to say HBO should just give their work away because it's free after they produce it for them to do so. But that's not terribly feasible within our contemporary economic realities, as theoretically cool as it might seem. What I do think is important to address here is how this sort of question will be increasingly necessary to answer, and in a variety of ways, as more of our infrastructure becomes dependent on technology to operate and moderate. Just as airports become more dependent on QR codes and similar gadgetry, to make sure people are relegated to the portions of the building where they're supposed to be, more of our economic infrastructure, our legal system, distribution apparatus, communication channels, and everything else will be, in some cases slowly, in some cases quite rapidly, changed over to something very similar, but just different enough, to something electrified. The foundation will still be the same, more or less, but our contemporary system of incentives and punishments of community-shaping cultural norms and rationales for adhering to them will no longer work exactly as advertised. This is a difficult sort of shift to notice. Much of our thinking takes place inside these boxes, and it's the boxes that are changing. It's the spaces within the infrastructure that will change, but we'll need to watch the infrastructure itself to understand and maybe even predict, if we're lucky, what those changes might be and how to alleviate the worst possible outcomes of those changes while at the same time bending and reshaping ourselves and our expectations to fit within the new seemingly inevitable realities that probably won't be horrible but just different and different enough to change things in a way that they open up a lot of negative potentialities that weren't there before. 
What's on the chopping block today, what will likely change first as a result of this tech-enabled changeover, is the way that we guard things, the way that we punish, the way that we subtly orient people toward their assigned path, the way we store and disseminate valuable things, the network of supply lines along which those valuable things travel from production point to consumption point, and the cultural norms that determine what we value and how we interact with one another. We're going to need to figure out what's okay according to these new norms and guidelines. For instance, the security hacker in that original post, he's a white hat hacker, meaning he's with the good guys. He helps companies and other groups reinforce their technological security systems. The talk he ended up giving, in which he told that story about bypassing the QR code reader, was filled with advice for airports and airlines as to how they can make their off-limits areas more secure, while also preventing such errors, errors that inspire some types of people, like him, to break things in the future. I still can't help but wonder, though, what might have happened had he been caught in the act. Especially with airport security being what it is right now, how might it have looked for a hacker of any hat color to have faked his identity at an airport to get someplace he wasn't supposed to be within that airport? What would have happened, for instance, had there been no human security at that particular airport lounge, but instead a scanner of some kind and an automated machine gun for security, something tech-based to ensure people's safety, but something that doesn't allow any room for nuance? And again, this could apply just as much to a human-based system. Maybe he tries to explain to a trigger-happy security guard that he's the good type of hacker and gets shot due to a misunderstanding. But these types of issues become even more problematic and potentially common as we build these new structures without full consideration for how people will view them, how people will view bypassing them, and how we might build an intermediary set of systems to help us bridge the gap between where we are today with a blend of internal and external norm enforcers and where we're very likely going next to a place where the perceived nature of the spaces we share and how to operate within them could be substantially different than it is today. If you are enjoying this podcast, consider helping support it. You can do so by sharing it with a friend, sharing it on your social network of choice. You can contribute monetarily via PayPal or Venmo. Go to letsnotethings.com slash contribute to find out more about that. You can also contribute monetarily via Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash letsnotethings, you can buy one of my books, which you can find at colin.io and wherever you typically get your books. And you can also help out by checking out our sponsors. Everlane is my favorite clothing company. They're minimalist and well-built. They look really good aesthetically as well. And they're very reasonably priced for what you get for clothing that lasts. And if you go to letsnotethings.com slash Everlane, I will receive a commission for anything that you buy. So it won't add anything additional to what you pay, but a part of their profits will be paid to this show for sending you over there. So it's a great way to help support the show while also getting a new garment or three if you are in need of such things. Let'snotethings.com slash Everlane. And the other sponsor today is Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT, you will receive a free month of Audible free and a free audiobook of your choice that you can spend on anything within their massive collection of audiobooks. And if you do not have a book in mind already, the book that I would like to recommend today is called Permission Marketing by Seth Godin. And I had to actually go back and check in the archive to see if I'd recommended this before. I'm kind of surprised that I haven't. This book, and frankly a whole lot of writing by Seth Godin, essentially everything he's ever written, was super formative for my early marketing development. He's essentially a marketing philosopher who takes a whole lot into consideration beyond the normal metric of dollars and cents. And permission marketing is a great example of that. He's essentially saying that a lot of the marketing that we do is interruptive, and consequently, we are putting our message in front of people at the worst possible time. If you are interrupting a television show with a message for whatever widget you're trying to sell, do you think people are going to love you for that? For interrupting something that they would love to be doing instead? No, you're becoming an annoyance. And so the concept of permission marketing is to essentially get permission from people to be in their space. 
And you do that in a bunch of different ways. But one of my favorite is to create things of value that then consistently bring people back. And in doing so, you're able to expose them to different ideas, including things that you might be promoting, books or other products that you might have to sell, for instance. But you're doing it in such a way that they come to you, usually. They are giving you permission to be all up in their space. And they're doing that because you consistently add value in some other way. Rather than interrupting them, you are yourself becoming the thing that they want to be exposed to. And to me, that's just a wonderful philosophy in terms of marketing as a whole. And a lot of his work, his books and his blog posts and everything else, kind of work along the same line. A more holistic, to me, more consumer-friendly and not brazenly, harmfully capitalist way of approaching sales and marketing and everything of that nature. So if you're looking for a good read, Permission Marketing by Seth Godin comes highly recommended. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. And the show notes for this episode and every episode of this podcast can be found at letsnotethings.com. You can find me on pretty much every social network at Colin is my name, though it's just Colin Wright on Facebook, if you're into Facebook. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Thank you.